I'm Matt from Sugar Baby Cycles. I'm Graham. And uh, this is this our is, shop. Yeah, this is our shop. Welcome spot. to uh, Sugar Baby Cycles in Ben Lomond, right? Yeah, Ben Lomond. Ben Lomond, okay. <laughs> ben Lomond. <laughs> That's Dennis talking there. Well, should we give you a little shop tour? Yeah. Uh, before we do a shop tour, let's uh, talk about how you guys linked up. Like, how did you guys make this happen? I started the shop in Fresno probably four years ago. Graham and I were buddies before that. Um, We've been riding buddies for probably seven years now, eight yeah, years. I think we met in our, in our early 20s, and uh, he had left a note on my motorcycle out in a parking lot that was like, hey, this thing's sick. Like, let's get together and build and ride. And like, I had like one other friend that was into bikes. And so I called him and, and uh, right then he was like, yeah, if you're free right now, we're about to ride up the coast and go get tacos and I don't know, do hang out with girls or do something. And so I was like, all right, let's go and dropped everything I was doing. And we went and hung out and pretty much, uh, spiraled downhill from there. Just like doing bike stuff every day since. And this is where we met was in Santa Cruz. And then. Matt and his wife, Julia, moved up to uh, Oakland for a little bit, and then they moved out to Fresno for a few years. And so that's where, like, the house out in Fresno had, like, a shop built on the property, um, kind of similar to this. And that's where we sort of started to get these big ideas. Like, you know, Matt was like, I think I'm going to start making some parts and see if we can sell them. And, and uh, you know, and it, it sort of started as, like, making like some, some custom sissy bars and a few other things. And then pretty quickly realized there was not a ton of people doing like aluminum sand casting out there. And that's got like a really rich history within choppers. Um, and so, yeah, I think kind of your idea, right. With like aluminum casting was like yeah, the yeah, spot in, the spot in Fresno was like huge for that. You know? Yeah. The shop was, the shop was way bigger in Fresno. Everybody asks, uh, what's the best kind of shop? It's, it's the shop that's already there that you don't have to build. That's the best kind of, that's the best kind of building. Um, we built this one here kind of based on the space that we had, but we make do. We got about a thousand square feet of fabrication space. How long did it take to build this whole shop? Uh, kind of, I don't, what do you say, Graham? Was it maybe nine months? I'd say like eight or nine months. Like we the, fully built it ourselves. There was no uh, contractors involved. There was, we dug the trenches, poured the concrete, put the building up. Uh, we built everything you see, wired it. Um, we just didn't really have the means or the money at the time to hire anybody. And yeah, it was, it was the like, dream. how do we build like a, a like $50,000 shop for like, twelve thousand dollars or something you know like just for material cost basically that's impressive um, I, w I thought you guys had like contractor and just no no we brought a company out obviously to pour the cement like we don't have a yeah we a can't mix truck. like a cement plant and mix the cement like we weren't like sitting there with shovels but, like mixing like, the cement but you know we were out here for for days and weeks with um stakes and wire like mapping out where to pour the slab and and building the forms and everything and it was like I think this is how they do it, you know, like. <laughs> it hasn't fallen down yet, so we'll keep going. <laughs> yeah, it gets a little scary though. Like the winds, the winds really pick up sometimes and we're kind of like, I hope this, <laughs> hope everything's tight, you know. So far so good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this shop's like a little different. We really like, at the old shop in Fresno is where we really like started diving into more complicated bike stuff and being like, all right, you know, we can hardtail on frames. We can try to work, try to work on our own engines. We can try to do all of these things that seem so like far out of reach. Um, and, and I think like that was the same sort of mentality that, that turned into coming back here. Like we learned so much in the shop in Fresno and then we came back here and was like, like we have to have a shop and we can like, set it up a little bit better. Yeah. And we can set it up to like fit our needs a little bit more. Um, and, and, you know, not be so worried about like the shop in Fresno was a lot bigger in terms of like floor space, yeah. uh, but the shop is way taller and we built the upstairs and it's really like, it's like pretty much the perfect size yeah. for what we need to do. And how's a lot of our, I mean, the shop's one thing, but it's the tools that are in the shop yeah. that, uh, was it tough to get all the tools in here? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you walked, you walked up here. 
you can see how muddy and the trees and, and everything. I mean, it's, you know, we're not. And the same goes for just building the shop even. Like we had to rent like a, a scissor lift. A forklift. So we could try to build this. And it was raining kind of like how it is today. And we had built a, like just a bunch of pieces of plywood coming up the hill. And we we're trying to like drive the scissor lift up the hill and it's sliding yeah. down the plywood so and like, the yeah, it was like. <laughs> Kind of, you know, one of the hardest places to try to build a shop. Um, then you go and put, you know, ten or 15,000 pounds of machinery in it. Is, uh, no, that's super impressive. This is a story in itself, you know? Yeah. <laughs> a journey in itself. Sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, it was months and months. Like, I, I, worked for a, I worked for this chicken farm at the time, and so we had a ton <laughs> of property out at the farm. Yeah. And when we started looking into, like, these shop supplies, we realized, like, they... They, they couldn't deliver it to our house. They we, can't yeah. bring stuff like this all the way up in the mountains. So we had to like get it dropped off at the farm and then rent a truck know, and put it all in. It was like thinking back on it now, actually, it was like nine months of like every single day thinking about how is this shop going to get. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's easier to move like a 4,000 pound tool than a 500 pound uh, piece of material because no one can lift this. So you get a machine to lift this. You know, when you get all these beams and stuff that the shop's made out of and they're, they're 400 pounds a piece or whatnot, <laughs> that really sucks because you can get four drunk dudes to move it. Yeah. Um, I don't care how many drunk guys you have, no one's picking up the mill. So, uh, you know, it's more of a pain to move the small stuff than it is the big stuff sometimes. I can show you guys some of the tools if you like. Yeah, let's give us a tour. All right. Let's go from one end of the shop to another. If you've ever bought anything from us, this is where it sits before it goes to you. This is our assembly table, all of our packaging supplies, um, snacks, I guess. Uh, everything that we sell comes here before it goes out. Uh, this is a sort of a newer tool for us. This is our sun and hone. Um, for those of you that don't know, a hone is essentially a set of stones. This machine turns and spins. Um, this is an oil-fed system. And this can essentially, in simple terms, uh, make a hole super round. It doesn't sound that exciting, but when you're building motorcycles, you're really focused on a, really, a lot of round holes. Um, moving from this to our lathe. This is a LeBlond Regal. It's probably late 40s, early 50s, so it's not the most sophisticated machine. But it does a lot of work for us. Um, we've got a big swing here so we can load really large parts into our lathe. Uh, this is a phase converter from our friend Alex here. That essentially t takes our uh, single phase power, you know, traditional power you have inside a, a residential home turns into uh, power that our larger industrial machines can use. Uh, so this is the machine that processes all of our clutches, uh, air cleaners, and whatnot. You know, we've had that machine for quite a few years. So our miscellaneous tooling, this is a uh, mill and lathe, collets, drill bits, uh, some of our more uh, indicators and whatnot. So this will be our bridge port. This is a Series 1 J-head, probably from the mid-70s or so. Um, I rebuilt this machine when we bought it. These machines are not particularly expensive uh, if you know how to rebuild them, and it's just like a bike or anything from the 70s. Uh, but we've added a couple things. We've got a new all uh, digital readout system. So this essentially tells us all of our different axis locations. Uh, this is another really heavily used machine. We've got power feed on this machine that's really nice. If you're looking to, you know, buying a mill or doing any kind of milling work, uh, something like a readout, power feed, all these things make a huge difference. It really allows us to work a lot faster. Um, I wish I bought the Series 2, which is a significantly larger machine, but you know, we'll get there. All right, we've got some, some presses, hydraulic, an arbor. This used to be our old motor table here. 
Uh, now it's just kind of miscellaneous bike stuff that we don't know where to put. We're running out of space pretty quick. Um, I'm a big fan of these. <laughs> and you kind of move a really, really weak parts room. I don't know if you saw that. The rusting out sprinter van out there, but that's full of motorcycle parts <laughs> yeah, that okay. we decided like within the last, uh, like within the last six months that we really needed like a dedicated motor building space because um, <clears throat> in the last couple of years, we've tried to like do as much as we can on our own engines. And like without a clean organized space to do that, it gets really difficult. This whole room used to be just full of parts and we would like load it up in the trucks and go to the swap meets. Um, and now we just kind of threw all those parts over into the van outside and like built this into our ideal little engine building room. Um, and it's kind of a mix of like, you know, there's a handful of motors in the shop right now that belong to us and we're sort of, you know, piecing them together at like whatever rate they, they kind of need to be together at. Um, obviously the Born Free bike's kind of the first one up. So this is a marble table that we have. Um, this is another tool that people often ask, oh, isn't those really expensive? Um, they're not very expensive, they're just super heavy, but this is incredibly flat. I think it'll state somewhere out, it says on the back here, but. You know, this is like probably close to like, uh, you know, 50 millionths flat or something insane like that. So it's super useful when we're building motors and we're surfacing things. Uh, we've got a valve cutter. Um, this is where we keep all of our engine equipment. Um, measuring tools, spare parts. This is a motor that I'm working on currently. This came out of my bike from last season. It's a little bit dirty, but we'll clean it up. It's a, 90 inch generator shovel that I'm kind of playing with some uh, recutting the heads and increasing compression and whatnot. But spare parts, uh, chemical cabinet. I'm kind of paranoid about fires. So it's really nice to kind of keep all your gasoline, all your flammables away from the workspace. A really crappy uh, way to store all your hardware, but we're not perfect. This is all just spare stuff. This is generally for four-speed transmissions, early Harley transmissions. Um, it's nice to have, you know, we do do some work for people. Uh, you know, if you need something rebuilt, we can help. It's also nice to have because uh, for our own, for our own needs. Got a fireplace. Probably should have lit that today, but We'll get there. Yeah. And then I think the only other spot, well, we'll there's- go, We'll go upstairs after. Yeah, there's the grinding room. But this room. is kind of my favorite place in the whole, this is, the, this is my favorite idea for the whole shop. Um, you know, we've got a welding table. We pretty much only do TIG welding in this shop, um, but we have a MIG welder, cheap plasma setup. But the grinding room and like the, the sort of, Covered grinding room areas is a must for us, and I don't know how we live without it. Yeah, I mean, because this is this is not this is probably only a couple weeks, um, and we kind of cleaned up recently, but with air tools, uh, a bead blaster, we've got this big uh, kind of exhaust fan that we use uh, really commonly. So if we're cutting things that are kind of noxious in here. Uh, we're not breathing in too much junk. All sorts of assortments of cutting and grinding discs, you know. If you're getting into fabrication, if you're getting to working on your own bike, you know, don't count on what you see at the hardware store. There's a huge world of, of specialty grinding and cutting equipment that just makes your life so much easier. I mean, it took me years and years to even, and I don't know, I mean, there's, there's so many people that know so many more things about this, but we're just kind of getting into it. I mean, all these, you know, these mini belt sanders. Thank you, Drake, for lending us this one. I mean. Game changer? Yeah. Oh, we love it. I mean, you, you know. And then uh, one more tool down here. This we use a ton. This is our uh, tumbling machine. 
So this puts the surface finish on pretty much all of our aluminum parts and our steel parts as well. So this is a, a liquid fed tumbler. These guys are actually based in California. They're very nice. They helped us out with this. I can turn this on. It's going to probably make a terrible noise, but... It's kind of another one of those, given when we, when we do production runs, this tool is indispensable to us. Well, should we go upstairs? Yeah. There's upstairs and, and the... Uh... OSHA approved stairway. The upstairs kind of largely acts as like a little office when we're working. We usually have the computer up here and you know we print all the labels and, and shipping stuff and keep like shirts and yeah. other stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, like whenever we have friends over and stuff, this upstairs is like where everybody likes to hang out, yeah. you know, like, the entire shop, right? yeah, it's still a shop. And so we can be dirty and we can, you know, hang out up here and be loud. And it's like, you got a cool view of the whole shop and. It's nice to have a space that's not directly involved in the fabrication space because people like to hang out. We like to throw parties. We normally throw one big party every year. It's the uh, um, Born Flea, right? Yeah, Born Flea. I don't know if there'll be a Born Flea this year. Uh, Born Free is kind of stealing our, our whole thing, you know? Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it's nice to have a space, you know? Yeah. Keep the computer clean, have a mini fridge, and come up here and have a beer. What's your favorite part about here? Favorite part about up here? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, we've got, like, an endless supply of, like... <clears throat> Oh, vintage magazines Old that magazines. we probably can't even show some of these on <laughs> Old, camera. Old like hot rod mags and it's a good one for uh, stuff. It's like, you know, friends will come up here, like John will come up here during the week and just, just sit up here for hours looking through old magazines while we're working. There's some photos. We have some photo books here of, uh, we were probably all 18 on our, fo on, our on our first motorcycles, you know, just, memory just, books, just right? memories and kind of gives you. I mean, this is like, this is going to sound very cheesy, but I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah, make your You know, you kind of forget. There's a lot of guys who buy a bike. They live alone in a city or in a suburb, and, and I feel like maybe they don't quite get it. You know, it's not about the bike or what kind of bike you have. or it's about even, memories. Yeah, it's about trips with your friends and being in the shop with people. I mean, it's just not a solo kind of experience. Yep. This is your old air filter, right? Or like the, the casting? Yeah, that's the very first casting I ever did. Wow. That was pre-everything I knew about aluminum. What made you get into uh, casting in the first place? You know, it, I found out pretty quickly that when you're doing, when you're trying to sell parts, or you're trying to make money off motorcycles, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, I started off doing custom work. And when you do custom work, it's, it's kind of brutal. Um, and you really quickly find out that, you know, you could spend 10 hours making a really cool sissy bar. I mean, you know, and in reality, shop rate's about $100 an hour here. Nobody's gonna spend $1,000 on a sissy bar. So how do you find a way to keep creating parts and, you know, to, to, how do you create a repeatable process, essentially? Yeah. I mean, casting's kind of the original you know, before we had CNC and uh, 3D printing and laser cutting and whatnot, uh, you know, sand casting was the original way to reproduce, you know, a lot of parts. So I made an air cleaner early on and people were really interested in it. And I thought, well, is there a way I can continue to make these? Because yeah. if I had to obviously shape those by hand or create them each way, some, you know, every time it wouldn't be possible. So I yeah. got into sand casting and it really provided us for work for a lot of years. You know, we don't do quite as much sand casting as we used to. Um, it's just kind of the way that we're progressing, but. How did you come up with the name uh, Sugar Baby Cycles? It was kind of originally a joke. Um, a lot of this is possible. You know, we do well in business, we work hard, but you need help. And my wife has always been super supportive of what we wanted to do, um, to be able to 
put up a shop like this and take nine months, I mean, by yourself, it's, if you have the real guts, I mean, maybe you can pull that off. But for me, it was, I need somebody who can, you know, I need somewhere to live. Um, I need someone to help me and to, you know, like, I mean, I owe all of this to her in some sense, you know. So, and, in the, and to add a little bit to that, I mean, originally, I was really interested in building springers and building front ends. Uh, Sugar Bear was a huge influence, you know, one of the original 70s, uh, you know, kind of the guy who I may, might say invented the long springer, uh, or at least the look behind it. So I thought it was a good play, and then at the end of the day, you got to have a name that sticks out. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times I see, like, Bone Rebel Choppers or something, and yeah, man, that's cool, man. You school, sound like school custom. <laughs> exactly, you sound like a tough guy, but uh, I just felt like Sugar Baby had a little role to it, you know. Name to it, right? Yeah, you know, and I'm like, it's like not the type of thing you forget, yeah. or except for except for that that one lady that called you Sprinkle Daddy. Yeah, it was a girl who called me Sprinkle Daddy. <laughs> I, it's, it, you know, it sticks in your head. You yeah. like it almost stands out like a little too much yeah. at first. You're kind of like, no, I like I like the name. Yeah. I mean, makes you guys approachable, you know what I'm saying? And I'm For way sure. too pretty to be paying my own rent. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, I mean, that's most of the shop. There's yeah. still the... Uh... Are these uh, on the website, the merch? Yeah, we are running pretty low on those. Um, yeah, this is everything that's left for the most part, right? No, we got a bunch of shirts in the house. What's your uh, website? Uh, I think it's sugarbabycycles.com. Oh, nice. Yeah. Simple. Yeah, you can find it on the top of our Instagram page. If you type in Sugar Baby Cycles on Google, it'll come up. You know, got to make it yourself marketable. Let's look at some bikes, right? Enough shop. Yeah, Let's show a little bit of the casting <laughs> show area. Show the casting too. area. I mean, yeah. yeah. What's this machine right here? Oh, it's a little uh, brake, roll, shear sort of combo. Um, Essentially, we use this. Let me get this to turn. This area that rolls, if you put a piece of metal in here, you'll end up with a oh. peripheral circular. And then down here, where you aren't supposed to put your fingers, is a shear. Okay. So, in our air cleaners, whenever you see like a stainless mesh, um, I think this is just some leftover stuff, but something like this, we'll put it in this machine to cut it. We'll put it up here to fold it, or to roll it, I should say. Pretty useful. It's one of those tools that if you don't have it, it, it's a pain, you know. <laughs> well, you can see it's kind of wet. It's a little messy outside. When it's wet, we don't do a whole lot of aluminum casting. But this is the area that we do the majority of the aluminum casting. Um, the kind of an issue with the aluminum casting world is it's not really a, what's the way to say it, Graham, like a novice. There's not a lot of hobbyist aluminum casting guys, so you kind of got to create everything yourself. And this is our furnace. This is our mixer. This is what processes our sand. Um, we use a green sand for aluminum casting, which is essentially a water-based sand. So you mix your sand with some clay. We add some other additives. You mix it with water. And that creates this kind of kinetic sand, so you can imprint a piece to the sand and fill that mold with aluminum. Uh, this is our furnace. A lot of people call it a forge. It's technically a blast furnace. People are always surprised by how small it is. Um, you know, we melt at a roughly, you know, 1200, between 1200 and 1300 degrees is where we melt our aluminum. So when you create a large space, it gets really difficult to raise those temperatures. Um, by keeping it really small and tight, we can melt, melt probably five, seven pounds of aluminum in this thing. And it probably takes about 20 minutes or so to reach uh, 1250. Over here is our casting table. You know, it's a lot of things with casting are it's kind of a violent process. You have a lot of heat, um, a lot of wear. So a lot of these things that we use are kind of disposable. Um, you know, people kind of think it's this very high-tech operation. When we're making our molds, 
there's a lot of finesse. There's a lot of work going into making our molds and making everything look appropriate. But in reality, all these things get replaced often enough that you kind of just use, you know, what you have uh, rather than sort of investing in a bunch of equipment that you're going to end up breaking. So our bikes are just modeled after us. They're proportional to both Graham and I. Um, that's not actually true. But, I mean, Graham, why didn't you start? My bike's a lot less interesting with the motor out on the table, so. Okay. You should go over yours, and uh, maybe I can move mine out of the way so you guys can kind of see. Yeah. Um, my, like, my kind of primary personal bike right now is this uh, 1971 FLH shovel head that I, I bought, I think, like six or seven years ago um in utah and it was kind of like the classic swing arm tweaker bike <laughs> had like a a wooden battery box and the lights didn't work and the you know and i was like way in over my head i had ridden a sportster for a few years and changed like handlebars and front end on it and stuff but but i went and picked this bike up and like it didn't have a key the guy just had an ignition switch like this wired into it and so it was just on or off. And I, I kind of like realized right then when, when I drove out to Utah to get this bike that I was like a little over my head. Um, Cause I asked him for the key after we loaded the bike into the truck and, <laughs> and he's like, there isn't a key. Like you just, it's that switch like I showed you and you kickstart it. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> started trying to figure out how to ride it first of all and then you know, since then everything's been rebuilt and we've gone through it and Matt and I hardtailed the frame and, you know, this bike's had a handful of different versions. It's been short with like a little wide glide and a big sissy bar and all kind of all kinds of different styles that I thought was cool at, at whatever time. Um, and then most recently we, we raked the neck and put the springer on and, uh, repainted it and got rid of the sissy bar and this was this was probably about a year and a half ago so i've been riding it like this for a while now you know i rode it like this down through mexico for the last edr and you know we took a handful of trips in the summer um and it's kind of like it's kind of right now everything that i always wanted it to be you know it's like i i used to like change my handlebars on practically a daily basis and I was just like completely obsessed with changing the bike all the time um, and you know now it's been like this for about a year and a half like I said and I think I think this is pretty much how it's gonna stay yeah last summer I picked up a 1950 panhead that's gonna be the next project it's one of these motors in the shop in here um, and so yeah the goal is just like to build that bike without having to sell this bike. And hopefully this is like the kind of bike that I still have when I'm 70, 80 years old and be way too afraid to ride it at that point. But like, you know, it's, I got no intentions of ever letting it go. Did you guys extend the Springer? No, I picked up the Springer at a swap meet. Oh, wow. um, yeah, kind of oh, drunkenly, <laughs> drunkenly in the middle of the night uh, in the dark saw that Springer leaning up against a van and we, with the help of some buddies kind of worked out like a combo deal with the Springer and a ratchet top transmission. And it was like, it was like the best day ever. Like we drove home from that, that swap meet out in Turlock thinking like, I just got like a perfect Springer. This is amazing. And we got it back here and threw it up on the bike to mock it up. And it's like, you couldn't find a single part of the Springer that was actually okay. Like, really? The both rear legs were bent, the Shit. front legs were bent, the holes at all the bottoms of the legs were completely ovaled out. <laughs> the you know, the rockers were smoked, the the top tree was destroyed, like it was like everything was just a complete mess. And so we spent I don't know how many months of like, you know, evenings. This was before I worked here full time with Matt um I'd come over after work every day and we just spent like hours and hours and hours straightening the springer Matt welded up all the holes at the bottoms of the legs and we you know built a fixture for the mill and remachined -mach all the holes and 
got it got to the point where it was like, I wish we had just... Because we can extend a Springer. It would have been easier to extend the Springer than it was to fix. A lot of times it, it's easier to build something kind of from scratch so, yeah. than yeah. to fix every single old problem. But you're trying problem. to keep the patina. You're trying to keep the original parts. Like there's a aspect to this that is very alluring where if you build a brand new Springer, you have to rechrome it. You have to buy new components. And that was part of the hard part. You know, like we, this is all the original chrome that was on it when I bought it. And so we were heating it up to bend it and straighten the legs, but only heating it up so much that we're not going to damage the chrome. And yeah. then we're, you know, like Dang. hopefully bending it slow enough to, we're not going to crack the chrome and weird little things. Um, but it's been like, it's, it's been pretty much amazing since we got it fixed. I've not really had any problems with the Springer. I'm, I've got, uh, I, I'm missing like the internal springs here. There's usually actually four yeah. different springs and I, I didn't put those in when we rebuilt it. Give them a hop. <laughs> so it, yeah, it, it bounces pretty easily. And sometimes when I'm kind of going through corners, it like, oh, I guess this is probably the safest way to do it. But it's, it's a bit loose right now. Um, <laughs> so you obviously feel that, like, going down the road and going through corners. And I've got a set of, set of springs, you know, I'm going to throw in there before the next time we really start riding. How big is this gas tank, dude? It's really small. Yeah, we're, you know, it, it holds like 1.6 maybe maybe 1.8 gallons it looks so good though it looks great and we got it through a kind of a weird a weird deal one of the buddies that i used to live with when i met matt uh, his grandpa used to be into like harley drag racing back in the 60s and stuff oh. and he had a full like xlch drag bike from back then yeah. um and this you know matt his name was also Matt, gave this entire basket case project of this 60s drag bike to, to other Matt. And this gas tank came with it. And it spent a lot of years kind of on the shelf, hanging out around the shop. And I spent a lot of years like telling this Matt how cool that gas tank was and it really, really neat if I could run it. It's, it's essentially got the same width dimensions as like a stock Sportster tank, but it's a lot shorter. Yeah. It's like somebody cut a couple inches out of the bottom. Um, and I think kind of the, the conclusion that we may have landed on is that it actually might have been a production part at some point. Oh, wow. um, you know, Century was making a lot of springers and a lot of single loop frames and potentially some of these gas tanks. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of them still in existence. We've been talking about reproducing them. Yeah, because a lot of people have shown a lot of interest in them and you know we've we've it's uh we've considered making them for people but we get busy yeah <laughs> yeah what color is the uh the bike dude it looks really good like dark cherry-ish yeah nice. you know it's a kind of a mix of colors um our buddy drake who we work with is is really a wizard with fabrication and with paint as well and he sprayed this bike with, I think it was like a, some kind of a dark primer coat. And then it was a, I believe a PPG color called Volcanic Red. Uh -huh. And then a handful of pearl clear coats over everything. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he's, he, you know, he's an absolute wizard. He sprayed this on and it never got wet sanded, it never got oh, really? anything. Oh, yeah, it, he laid it on this smooth. Um, and I don't, I don't do much paint, so I don't know if that's like a, a skill or a technique based thing, but it was really incredible having him paint local? the frame. Yeah, 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 he lives down he, the street. He contributes Felton. to the shop a good amount. Before we hop over to Matt's bike, uh, top three mods that you like on your bike. So, uh, lately I've been getting really into like, I think both of us have been getting into kind of, uh, you know, I'm going to say performance, but it, that's going to make it sound wrong. Not like T bars on a Dyna type of thing, but like legitimate performance improvements that'll make these old bikes run better. Uh -huh. um, and I threw this 
two into one exhaust on there, which I always, I had heard that a little bit of back pressure and a two into one exhaust made these engines really happy. Um, and, and so I threw that on and I put a little bit of a hotter cam in. And then at the same time is when I upgraded to a diaphragm clutch and I've got one of our super clutches in there right now. Yeah. And I think the three of those things in combination made this bike really extremely rideable. It's like, it's got great response. Uh, you know, it feels hot, like it wants to go fast. It's, it's an 80 mile an hour all day kind of bike. Um, and the only limiting factor is the Springer. I yeah. start to have like a hot rod. my yeah. front wheel hops. But yeah, that was the idea. And that was actually like where I got this idea for the color from yeah. was I had found a, a handful of old hot rod photographs that were like kind of this dark red color and had some white accents. And I just like yeah. kind of fell in love with that. And I've spent a lot of years like really di dialing in my, my wiring systems to be like truly as simple as they can be. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's kind of knock on wood, but it's been a really reliable bike for me for a lot of years. Um, and it's had its bad moments too. Like I've had the entire engine rebuilt. I've rebuilt the transmission. I've, I've gone through everything. It's eaten itself alive a number of times. Um, but you, you know, with, with these things, like you just kind of keep pushing and you keep fixing whatever's wrong with it. And the, the number of like possible problems is finite. Like you will reach a point where you can, you can ride them regularly and comfortably and, and they're uh, reliable. But yeah, in terms of mods, you know, I like the exhaust, uh, comfortable foot pegs. I used to uh, not have foot pegs on this bike and I only had, so years and years ago, Matt built me this foot peg, foot clutch setup that mounts to the kickstand. Yeah. Um, and so for a lot of years, that was my only foot peg. And then I just put my right foot on the cone on the other side of the motor. Oh, I see it, yeah. And it kind of lines up if you run like a mechanical brake, it's, yeah. it's sort of in the right place. And then this, this more recent time around, I put some actual foot pegs on that are a little lower and a little That's more nice, comfortable. Right? Oh my <laughs> God, man. It's like one of those things that for some reason we got to learn everything the hard way yeah. and people found out you know decades ago that comfortable seating position was actually good and like that's more fun though learn it yourself right? yeah first well it really means a lot when you learn it yourself like i spent so many hours with my my legs and stuff cramping up because we'd be on the road for six eight hours a day trying to trying to cram 400 miles in on these bikes yeah. And like you're sitting like a shrimp or something. It's you're just stuck when you get up by like, oh, oh, can't yeah, you gotta like stretch your legs out. So I mean, yeah, comfort and reliability and and a handful of kind of performance things. And then besides that, like you know, you can like make the bikes look crazy. Like whatever idea you have in mind, this bike handles amazingly. It's I could take my hands off the handlebars at freeway speeds and it tracks straight. It's like just because it's long and weird doesn't make it you know not uh, performing right yeah yeah exactly how do you uh pack your gears without a sissy bar it's a little bit tricky um you know i usually throw a little duffel bag just right onto the fender and i strap it down and then i think he's grabbing it right now but i also have this special rack that matt made me that's oh, entirely built out of stainless yes, I don't even know how to show this. Yeah, well, so we'll do this first. So it, it holds my license plate, first of all. And then it basically mounts kind of just like that um, and gives me a little place to pack a few things. And then this was designed to hold one of these Rotopax gas cans, yeah. And so, like, we built this, you know, kind of out of desperation right before going through Mexico for EDR and realizing that a... 1.6 gallon gas tank is just not going to cut some of those stretches. I mean, there's like a hundred miles in the desert, yeah. you know, there, there's a yeah. hundred miles in the desert. There's no gas. There's nothing. And then if you're stuck on the side of the road, like no one's going to stop for you. It's yeah. fucking hot. Probably everybody is like drunk or something. You're just people are like, yes? no. So that's, <laughs> that's yeah, like, after all our calculations, <laughs> your calculations work 
until you're really thirsty and you're riding through the middle of Mexico and you're like, you stop how for a beer. <laughs> fast can these bikes go? Because the Mexican highway is just, it's just wide open. What, do you remember the, na- the name of that highway? The one that goes up through the mountains and it comes back? Yeah. yeah. I don't remember what it's but, called. So you're like, just straight up nothing, you know? there's, there's nothing, nothing there. Yeah. And then not to mention that, but there's like, Semi trucks with mismatched wheels and crazy yeah. shit, and they're flying past you, and like you don't want to be next to them or behind them or whatever. So we like, we did, we sat down for hours. We were trying to calculate like, all right, how much gas do our bikes drink? You know, how many miles per gallon do we get? How much gas do we have in total between us? And Matt's got a set of split tanks on his bike that holds a good bit more gas. Um, still ran out. And yeah, so we calculated it all out, and on paper it was like we're gonna make it. We, you know, we probably have one or two extra miles for if something weird happens. And then sure enough, we were a handful of miles from the gas station and his bike stopped running. And I don't, oh, so he ran out of gas first. I had a little leak or something in my oh, pet so cock that. that was kind of just, yeah. I'm not even sure what was going on. And so we, we like, blame it on that. We but. determined that you were out of gas and I went to ride up and I had already used my spare. I went to ride and fill this up and fill my bike up and come back and get him. Yeah. And then I ran out of gas on the way to the gas station and had to push the bike for a while in the desert. And it was like one of those weird- Good memories though. <laughs> good memories and you kind of do crazy things out of desperation. Like the gas station's packed as you've seen um, when you get to finally that first gas station. And I just like, I remember just walking my bike in yeah. and there were lines of people lined up in bikes and stuff. And I just saw an open gas pump and went straight to it. And started filling up all my stuff, and there was two guys that were like getting mad at me, like you cut the line, blah blah blah. And I just like, I don't think I said a single word to them. It was just like head down, fill everything up, yeah. fire the bike back up, and go. Um, and then, yeah, you know. But I think like something like like the gas in Mexico smells different, and I feel like I have a theory that we were getting different mileage. Yeah. I think there's some kind of different formula. Yeah, we, we kind of smoked our bikes coming out of Mexico. We were good and fired up. You know how it is. Graham said you, at some point you work out all your little issues in your bike. And you go take it to Mexico and, and ride it 100 miles an hour at 3 a.m. And you'll find all that the, the issues will come back. Yeah, it's wild. So you like, and then on the way home, we were like just feeling good. Like you're beat down, you're tired, it's hot, but you're kind of proud and like stoked. Yeah. And so I think we left, we left San Felipe and pretty much rode as hard as the bikes would go all the way back. It's just you two that went? Yeah, I mean, we met up with a handful of friends down there. It was just us two um, on the road. But we, yeah, we kind of went off on our own rogue mission yeah. throughout the whole thing. Are you guys going to the next year one? I don't know, maybe. We, just, we do a lot of, I mean, like this last summer, I mean, we, I, I, I couldn't even give a number, but we rode every week, every weekend, out of state lines, the Sierras, to Mexico, into Northern California, down the coast. I mean, we put a lot of miles on the bike, so it can be hard to kind of choose yeah. what trips we're gonna go on. Yeah, Especially you wanna go to places that you've never been. Right? Yeah, exactly. Mexico is great, but it's, it's um, Check out the list yeah, it's, it's, it's a little rowdy. Sometimes you kind of go, am I really making the best decisions? Uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Last question, did you uh, name the bike? No. Well, all, a bunch of my friends have named it different things. Uh, you know. They don't even want to say it. Red Rocket, <laughs> and re- all, kinds of, all kinds of dick jokes. Um, but I, I don't, yeah, I'm not like, I'm not huge on names, so I kind of, it just is what yeah, it is. Just you know? Yeah, just right. Cone Sobel. Yeah. All right, let's uh, get into the more free bike a bit. Uh, let's talk about your bike first, your personal bike. Well, it's pretty, it's pretty sweet. Um, yeah, you know, I, um, I pulled, so here, actually I can show something kind of cool. So I, this is, had a 90 inch generator motor in it that I had built this last year and I never built a big bore motor. Um, and I think at some point everybody kind of was looking for a little bit more power and I had this desire to build a bigger motor. So. I put miles on this bike all summer. It was an incredible bike. Um, a lot of the cool features I'd like to show you guys are missing, but one cool one I can show you guys here. Um, it's very difficult to put hand clutches on these bikes. 
I built this chain system here oh, to, uh, to actuate the clutch, which really frees up a lot of space. Um, you know, we live in a really uh, hilly, difficult neighborhood. Uh, for those of you that ride a foot clutch, or I don't like the term, but a suicide clutch where you have no front brake and you have a foot clutch, essentially, uh, you kind of can't stop on hills very well. You know, for both Graham and I, if we're both coming up a hill, we're on a ride, we're going to San Francisco, we're going to go to a party or something, there are times sometimes where I'll pull up behind Graham. So when he simultaneously has to put his right foot on the brake to stop from sliding, and he also has to put his left foot on the clutch, you know, to put the bike into neutral, um, I can put my front wheel up against his uh, rear wheel and keep him from sliding down. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know... Uh, That's pretty cool. I never thought of it that way. But what happened to this motor was I was riding all summer. We did Mexico, Virginia City, Sierra's trip. We went to Cayucos. We went to Paso Robles, not to mention all the other. And these are all like fairly decent sized trips. Um, the bike performed amazingly. I was in love with the bike. And then on the last trip we took, I was driving. And this is a generator alternator conversion. So these are essentially a generator for a bike, for these early bikes, but they're slightly smaller. This is supposed to be a shaft with a gear on it. Oh, shit. Um, I can show you guys what happened to the motor. Put this down here. If we go over to this room really quick. Uh, it essentially sheared the entire shaft off and blew my generator apart. Let's see if I can find that piece somewhere. You can look inside here, you can see all the metal shavings left from the generator blowing up. It came in, see if I can find the correct gear. Too many gears. Essentially broke off and it shaved all the teeth off my idler gear here. You can kind of see how, that's how they're supposed to look. Yeah. Um, that sits just about here. So, yeah, and it's funny thing is I didn't even know what happened, so I actually drove it home. Oh, shit. Uh, with all that stuff in it. And when I took the motor apart, I realized that there was something wrong, um, that there was metal shavings. But luckily, we always run a screen through our breather cavity here, so none of the metal shavings are going to make its way through the rest of the motor. And then once I uh, sort of knew that I had to break some of this motor down and fix it, I had some kind of experimental stuff I wanted to try yeah. with the pistons and the heads. I'd be super excited to show you guys some other time, um, like what we're trying to do, but yeah. it was just kind of winter time, so I thought, why not break the motor down and we can kind of make some adjustments. Always more power. You know, I'm not a purist. I really like disc brakes. Um, this bike goes fast, so I want it to stop fast. So I like these Tokikos. I run these dual Tokikos. Uh, a nice little detail Graham and I like to do. Like these are all raked necks. You know, we, we uh, modify these necks. And I like to do a lot of metal work in them to give them the stock. You know, we add all this, we add all these details back in. Yeah. You know, to kind of preserve. Good. That's OEM. Yeah, and that's the idea, you know, like the best choppers have OEM aspects to them and custom aspects to them. And as ratty and dirty as they kind of look now, I mean, we expect these bikes to put on a lot of miles. I mean, we, neither of us own Evo, neither of us own modern bikes. Um, I mean, this is all we've got. So, you know, at the end of the season, this is kind of how they end up looking after you've thrashed them for quite a bit. It's kind of just like a, you know, a continuing cycle for the last however many years in our life is just get it ready for the summer and ride it like as much as it'll possibly go and as hard as you can. and then you just expect to i mean this is the first winter that i haven't torn this bike down in in probably six years it's come apart every single other time uh and it could use it you know i i dumped the bike one time going up some crazy hill and i created a nice little transmission leak for myself by dropping it on the clutch basket um and so realistically i could probably stand to rebuild the whole transmission um, but it's running well and it's shifting well and aside from the little leak, it's like, it might just stay together this year. We're a little busy. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, speaking of busyness. Yeah. Well, first off, congrats on, uh, you know, being invited builders. Thank you. How, how did that happen? You know, man, I don't know. 
uh, uh, we, in some ways, kind of like to keep to ourselves. Um, and uh, Graham had won. We'd gone to Virginia City. We're a big fan of Virginia City. It's just a fun show. A lot of our friends go. Uh, Graham won Best Shovelhead in Virginia City. Our friend Drake, who is in here quite a bit and is, does not technically work for the shop, but you know is in here a lot, won Best uh, FXR. He, he built a Turbo FXR. Um, and I think that may have gained some attention from some people. I don't really know, um, but we got a message one day that essentially said, you know, would you like to build for Born Free? Yeah. Uh, and at the time, we, I don't think we fully believed it. It's kind of something that... We spent a lot of years being like, so is this the year to go for People's Champ? Like, yeah. you know, that was always one of Matt's really big dreams, was to compete in People's Champ and win People's Champ and be an invited builder. And then oh, sort of this <laughs> unreal phone call of like, hey, do you, we'd like to have you as an invited builder if you That's think it. you can handle it. And, he, you know, he called me and was like, I, yeah, they're not talking about people's champ. They're talking yeah. about, like, actually building. Um, and so, I, you know, you're not going to say no. That's yeah. like, We're not going to say no, but I don't think we realized quite how much work it was going to be. It's been intensive and, and between... Graham runs a lot of the product. He runs, he runs a lot of the machines. I'm some part part time on that. If you know, and and am honestly devoting a lot of time to this and kind of pushing our ability. You know, the, the kind of cool thing is I think people assume it's a balance of doing things that you feel comfortable with and doing new things that you don't know. You know, so for for instance, like this is like the first dual carved pan head that I've built. Um, and something that we felt like important, that was important to me, with the preface of like, this isn't meant to be disrespectful to anybody else who, not everybody has the time or the space or the ability to build a shop and, and, and do these kinds of things, but you know, it's our name on the list. And so we felt it was important to do all the work. Um, so all the fabrication, all the motor work, I mean, we true our own flywheels, we fix our own cases, we rebuild the heads, um, you know, we're going to paint the bike. The leather is going to be handled by butt seats. Um, there's a couple small things, obviously, that, you know, I, I don't really, I'm not a leather worker, and so Butts is going to do an amazing job on that. Uh, but we felt like it was important to do our own stuff. I mean, it just, it just seemed like that's our name and this is our, this is our time to show people like, you know, like what we do, what we care about, so. It's pretty much gonna be your business card. Exactly, you know, and so right now we've got a ton of metal finishing work to do, but we're beginning to see the outlines of, you know, the bike that we really wanted to build. If you can uh, estimate how many hours? We're about a thousand hours. A thousand hours? Um, wow. it will, Probably be roughly at 2,000 hours by the time the bike's done, which... Um, the motor is like a 51. Uh, the, yeah, the motor's like a 51. We've got internal oiling pan heads. The oil comes up the cylinders. Um, you know, it was... It, this is a motor that I had found in a barn like years and years ago. Um, this motor actually used to be in my old bike before I built the 90 inch variety. So when they called for Born Free, I said, well, we've got a, um, we've got a motor that we can work with. The motor was completely empty. So we've been just, uh, we used the sun in that I showed you guys earlier. We uh, rebored the cylinders, fit fresh pistons. We rebuilt the crank, uh, resized the crank rollers. Um, you know, we're gonna have to send this all out to chrome and polish before I can assemble it. Uh, so we've got some motor assembly to do, but it should be pretty neat. I think like, you know, the other thing that sort of like brings both of us a lot of pride was trying to do something with this bike um, that like we haven't seen a whole lot of. And it's really hard to do anything that hasn't been done already. Yeah. Um, you know, but we sort of like picked and chose at some of the, the most peculiar bits that we could think of, like a stuffing a big twin in a VL frame with a four speed and a mostly big twin mechanical brake. And then, you know, like for years and years, 
we've both been really into the way that these these old Indian girders look. Yeah. So this is fully, this is like, it's funny. We posted this video on Facebook of us building this and everybody's like, I hate it when you ruin original Harley parts. I'm <laughs> like, this is not a Harley part. Yeah. This is just steel stock. I mean, we, we, this is fully machined, welded and fabricated and shot. There is no inch of this front end that came from any existing piece. Um, this is just steel stock that we've shaped and machined and welded and um, you know, this frame, parts of this frame are like early, early Harley, um, like VL. And so we set about to completely change the geometry of the frame while still using some of the original, you know, like it, 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 these frames are these beautiful, um, I mean, the actual plates and the castings and like we, you know, it's the, the best bikes are blends of OEM and custom in, in my opinion. So. You know, this frame is completely one-off, um, has completely different dimensions than, than, you know, any other frame that you could buy. And then obviously by, you know, I mean, I could start going over all the weird things that we've done to make this bike different. Uh, you know, probably the strangest thing on this side is uh, if I pick the bike up, and I'll get out of the way here. If I pick the bike up, you can see how aggressive the carb angle is. Yeah. And if you had standard float bowls, your fuel would leak through your float bowl down the throat of the carb. And I just thought, well, what a cool, you know, idea to angle these carbs not only forward, but also up and just give it this, this kind of fresh look. But well, and it, it reaches back to like old flat track racing. Yeah, and like, you know, British bike and drag racing where they're trying to get the fuel to fall down the carb, um, you know, and essentially I go, I like this idea, but how are we going to mitigate dumping fuel? And so the way you do that is you actually, these are something that I'm making and these are very rough, but this is like my little Saturn. This isn't a float bowl, it's essentially just a covering over the bottom of the carb. Um, and it provides fuel for the emulsion tube, which is the piece of the carburetor that kind of sucks the gas into the carb. And we removed the float bowls, and we moved the float bowls to the back of the bike. So these actually control our fuel level in order to send the correct amount of fuel to our, to our carbs. Yeah. And so it's this funny little thing where, like, you think to yourself, well, wouldn't it be cool if we could change the angle of these carbs and make something unique? And it ends up becoming this whole system of the fuel from the gas tank will come all the way to these these will fill with fuel, send fuel to the correct level to these carbs, and it just kind of devolves into more and more uh, uh, wildness, really. A couple of early ideas, like we didn't realize how much everything else was gonna have to change. Like, let's put like, <coughs> let's put like dual linkers that are at like a crazy kind of stack angle coming out, and then like, Okay, well, you have to like... Dual thing, right? Like dual headlights, dual carb, dual that. You know, so, and yeah. the pipes coming up, and, it, and then it's actually a, two gas tanks, yeah. and one of them is oil an tank. oil tank. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of weird, like... Yeah. Even like this clutch thing, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's cool. Yeah, these are all... I mean, you know, and then we kind of had this idea one day, Graham and I, um, well, we probably had a couple too many drinks, <laughs> and, uh, and everybody's asking us, what are you going to name the bike? And we're like, we hate naming bikes. That's <laughs> dumb. Um, but you kind of have to name a bike. Yeah. And I don't remember really where it came about, but I started making all these like little Saturn ringed things. You know, these are all yeah. cast aluminum. And it kind of started having this like a uh, spaceship themed thing. And I, I was like, let's name it Space Bugs from Outer Space. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of a joke, but it, weirdly did provide us a direction which I started working on all these organic yeah. eye beam shapes. And definitely bugs like that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know, and, and so I kind of had this idea like, you know, these are all, um, you know, handmade out of aluminum. They are going to require a ton of finishing work, but we'll save that for later. But it kind of gives it this weird organic, you know, you've got these OEM parts, you've got these custom parts, you've got these very rigid lines, you've got these very organic lines, like how many ways can we blend? And without like, yeah. without 
being gimmicky or being attaching yeah. too much to the theme. Having a little bit of a theme, like okay, like a, some kind of weird space bug. Kind of remind me of like a, a a flying mantis for some reason, yeah, right? Yeah. Totally. We've it's had the lights. The lights yeah. Yeah. And like the the long front end. It kind of looks like a spider or like a you know a praying mantis, and you're like. But if you put a bug on the bike, it's over. <laughs> you know, like then it's then it's lame. What a color scheme you guys going with, or that's a saving for later. It will be a um, a very very dark green, where you know where the sun is hitting it. We're gonna see some some dark dark green tint, and underneath we're kind of aiming for like a almost six into a black. Okay, got it. Uh, so you've got like a multi-dimensional paint job, but we're kind of a fan of one color. I'm not really sure why. It's like maybe like our own little NorCal style or whatever. But so the the frame same same color as the tins. Yeah. So the frame and the tins will and you know. Everything else will be chrome. You know, we kind of were aiming for, for black tires, black leather, green and chrome, you know? Are, yeah. Yeah. And we kind of, I think, always tend to go towards like solid color paint jobs. Not a ton of pinstriping and a yeah. image transfers and all kinds no of stuff. No flames. <laughs> just like, just kind of, you know, like similar ideas with this bike. Just like a really solid, yeah. nice, deep color. What's your style? You know? Yeah. And you don't want to like, you don't distract. I you think don't want to take away yeah. from the rest of the bike, yeah. you know? I, I think the, the big idea we have is, like, you want to pay attention to the overall form of the bike. And people who are incredible fabricators have something, and I'm just going to make up a term, but it's almost like a, like a blindness, like a talent blindness, where they're so obsessive over a specific thing that they can do that they lose the ability to see the entire form of the bike, you know? So like even though like maybe our little key thing that we do is aluminum casting, I'm trying to make the aluminum casting blend in, you know, just like this piece, we could have gotten a lot cra interesting. Yeah, it's you like it could have been a lot <laughs> crazier, but it's like a taco holder. Yeah, yeah, we posted that everybody was like, can I put a hot dog in it? Can I put a taco in it? But it, it's, the idea is not to present, oh, we're so good at aluminum casting. The idea is to show we're good enough at aluminum casting that you may not notice it. You know, it's, it has an OEM feel to it. It has an original feel to it. So, so I mean, that's, will you know. this piece be chrome in the future? Uh, that'll probably be either polished or chrome. Oh, nice. okay. And then there's going to be some molding in the tank here that also comes into this area. There's a lot of, the, the tanks are an area that we've not really worked extensively on, you know. It's, I shouldn't say that. There's been a lot of work in going into the tanks. Um, but it, this is a lot of finishing work that has to be done here. I don't want like to mean, do I mean, the tanks have almost received, like, too much work. Like, I mean, this side's an oil tank, and it's got all the provisions for return line and everything in it. And then this side, aside from being just a gas tank, also has the throttle cable routes through the gas tank. And it comes out here and then... We've got a double exchange um, inside of this tank. We have we have a single cable that comes into the tank and then hooks up to a double cable oh, system. Wow. Crazy. You know, this side isn't hooked up, but I thought, well, instead of hiding the throttle cable, why don't we make it a feature? I can't wait to see it like finished, right? Yeah, yeah me, me too. too. Yeah, us too. <laughs> <laughs> we can't wait to take a break. <laughs> it's like I don't know how many. 14, 15 hour days you can put in in a year, but this is like the longest we're break. gonna find out. This is the longest break we've had in a while. I know. On a Thursday, it's been a couple hours this morning, and we didn't do any work. We're like, I think we. Uh... So, this is your full time now, pretty much, right? Yeah. Yeah, we both work here full time. I mean, that's a one, that behind you is, a, is about one week of um, maybe 10 days of, of orders that we were filling. So, we are. Yeah. We get busy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so our, our kind of things that we're focused on right now are these super clutches, um, which we've gone over and we've posted about on our page a lot. And practically all modern bikes use a diaphragm clutch, which is essentially what the pro clutches and, and the, those types of things are. Um, but we were looking at those and there's a really like steep, you know, kind of pathway of entry into a pro clutch. Like they're really expensive yeah. and it's, I don't know how many years the two of us put off spending five or six hundred dollars. Well, and, to and the only one. other issue was they're not, they're not only very expensive, but they require you to change like all aspects. Yeah, that's what I was. You use their proprietary springs. Well, you, you have to replace the plates, hub and, and like you kind of end up or you're kind of owned by, you know, Primo. 
Um, which is not a problem because they make great products. You know, we're not going to come out here and tell people, oh, you should only buy our products. There's a million people who make incredible products. I didn't like the idea of having to completely... I think the idea was like, you know, this unit that we sell is these three pieces and you can take these and bolt it straight up to your clutch. More aimed at that market that's like people still using the three or five finger uh, clutch hubs okay. in a stock basket and everything. Um, and it really gives you like the, the type of clutch operation that you receive from a pro clutch or a modern yeah. Harley. It essentially uses the same technology that a modern Evo clutch, you know, but it uh, is for, for the most parts for, you know, 36 to 1984 Harley Big Twins. That's the fitment on these. Um, with your original three and five finger clutch. Yeah. And they, I mean, they've been great so far. Like I, I run one on my bike. We like, I've, I've got no complaints. You know, we did a lot of testing. We sent them out to a couple of our buddies yeah. that are all riding shovel heads and, you know, made sure yeah. that any little issue that they had, we try to fix. And so there's been, I don't even know how many different versions of this clutch to kind of get it to this point. Um, and the other cool thing is, is at least at this point, we've been kind of looking into some different means, but, but everything is manually machined in-house. Like every single one of these pieces is made right here on one of these two tools. Um, and it's like, it's, it's what we're doing full time. Yeah. So it's like everything is made with as much care as we can. Are these in stock right now? I uh, believe as of this morning. I think we're, uh, we are, as we have been speaking, we are currently sold out. But we try to restock weekly, you know? You know, and then the other main product that we're focused on right now is these oil coolers. Um, and we yeah. had kind of these thoughts riding through Mexico and, and really like pushing these bikes that like they, they start to perform poorly when they're too hot. Yeah. And we check our oil and it's like it's turned into water almost. Yeah. And like the viscosity's way down, things in the engine aren't being lubricated and cooled properly. And, and the original kind of oil coolers, we spent a lot of time looking at this, the style that bolts onto the front of the bike. Yeah. Um, and they're, you know, they're fine, but like... There's just too much wiring going to the You got to route right? the oil lines yeah. all the way up. If you don't like, you know, neither of us wanted to put one of those boxes on the front of our yeah. bikes yeah. that we spent so much time working on. You can put one on your bike and kind of show it really quick. Yeah, but so we wanted to design an oil cooler that was kind of hidden and... You know, the parts of it that you do see look good and would effectively help keep these older bikes running cooler. Um, and it's the type of thing like, you know, that not a lot of people are gonna put oil coolers on their bikes if they look bad. But if it's something that looks nice and it's something that's kind of hidden and easy to use, like all of a sudden you've got people that are treating their motors better and that are running, um, you know, cooling system for their for their oil which is like so critical on these bikes yeah so we kind of see right now i didn't put the oil fittings into this um just because this is one that i just want to show but the nice thing is you've got oil fittings here you're super close to your um return line so you're not rerouting your oil all over the place um you're pretty much fully hidden underneath the bike this big heat sink here and the moment you start your bike up, you give it some revs, let it warm up for a minute. You can touch this, you can feel the heat bleeding through. We're seeing like a 20 degree difference in temperature uh, you know, from your oil tank. But these older motors really provide no, uh, you know, I, I put this online, but there's, people think these motors are air cooled and they are, but an important factor in bikes like these is that you're essentially injecting oil into all the critical areas in your motor. That oil is absorbing a ton of heat and dumping it back into your oil tank. Yeah. So a lot of people kind of consider these also like an oil cooled in a way where you're, you know, your, your uh, air cooling can only do so much and you're generally removing uh, heat from like the outside of your cylinders, the outside of your heads. But what about your crank pin? You know, what about deep inside your heads? Oil is doing the work here to remove the heat and dissipate it somewhere else. And these bikes have no provisions from the factory to really uh, release any of that heat from the oil. So pretty much any oil cooler, I mean, obviously we're a fan of ours, they're billet, we make them all in-house. Um, they're very tough, they're hidden. 
But anything that you can do to cool your oil off is going to help your performance and help your longevity. I like the name too. Yeah, thank you. Stay, stay, cool. stay cool. It's it's more than just kind of decorative motorcycle parts. We've really been focused in the last few months on sitting down and thinking about like how can we, what could we, you know, if we're gonna make a living and base our lives around this, what can we do that actually it helps makes some kind of a difference, yeah. you know? And what can we do that is like helping to push the envelope on what's available and what's out there. And we're like, we look back at old old chopper magazines and stuff and there was like a, a crazy amount of ingenuity in the products available for sale. And it seemed like there were so many people making weird different things at small scales and trying to grow oil cooler businesses and clutch businesses and whatever the case is. And it, we sort of just like, you know, you felt like that was important and that was something that this this whole scene of people riding these old bikes could really use is like there's plenty of stuff out there that's decorative and that makes your bike look cooler um and there's a handful of things that it, you know help it to run better but but they're not necessarily geared directly at like these kinds of bikes yeah. these custom built old choppers um and so that's kind of the idea was like anything that we can think of that that would benefit us that we want to run like legitimately on our own bikes yeah. um, is something that's worth selling and something that's like worth, you know, putting 40, 50, 60 hours a week into creating. Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you guys would like to add? I don't know. It's kind of, you know, it's, you kind of look back, you go, I kind of miss, I mean, all these decorative parts we used to make. I was just looking in the shop right now, and I was just finding all these things that we once made and sold, you know. Um, and these were all production pieces for us, but I guess, it, you know, it makes me happy to see, you know, I'm not going to restate it like Graham said. It's, like, cool to make stuff that makes a difference. Yeah. Try to build bikes that you know, are different and can handle what we want them to handle. And yeah, I don't even know what else to add. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for having me, man. And thank you for sharing your stories and yeah. showing us your garage, you know? Yeah, I know you guys are busy, <laughs> like crazy for Born Free. And hopefully, you know, you guys make it far. Hey, thank you, man. Thank you, Graham. Thank All you. All right. <laughs>